Mary's Dream. This is a show where we talk about uh, how we write our books, how we publish our books, and how we market our books. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. Uh, look for The Writer's Dream. You can find us on YouTube. YouTube's a little bit more complicated. You have to put in my name, Linda Maria Frank. I am the author of Annie Tillery Mysteries. Um, put in the full name. Um, my picture will come up. Click on the picture and you will see approximately 200 interviews, most of them local Long Islanders. But there are a lot of writers on Long Island. In fact, in the square mile that I live in in Massapequa, there's five of us. So it's uh, pretty exciting. Anyway, if you uh, are a writer or a reader and you're interested in how books are made and uh, what writers are thinking, this is a good channel to um, to key into. Uh, I also put the shows on Cablevision. That's um, channel 115 at 2.30 on Thursday afternoon. So we're all over the place. And today we have uh, a wonderful author with us, Therese Dodaro. And she has written um, a number of books. She is an author um, and she is also an amateur genealogist. She does genealogy for people, which I think is very exciting. Uh, I'm a science person, love DNA, so I love this stuff. So, um, Teresa, today, uh, um, list your books. Tell us all the books you've written. Uh, my first book, The Tin Box Secret, came out in 2015, and it turned into a trilogy. The second book is The Hope Chest, came out in 2016, and then Reawakening in 2017. And then I wrote a separate book, The Porcelain Doll, in 2018. And then my latest book is The Bayman's Daughter, came out in 2021. Well, you've been a busy lady. <laughs> so today I, I think you wanted to feature The Bayman's Daughter. Yes. But you may speak about any of your books at any time. So, of course, we go to plot, character, and setting. So give us the elevator pitch for The Bayman's Daughter. That's one sentence and then you can go into detail. It's a time slip novel about a teenage boy who goes back in time to from 2012 to 1912 and meets a girl at John Ellis Roosevelt's summer home and he is the first cousin to Teddy Roosevelt. Okay, so what's a time slip? I've never heard um, that term before. It's like Outlander where one character goes oh, yeah. through time <laughs> and, um, and and meets someone from another time. Um, being a genealogist, that would be my dream, to yeah, go back all... in time and meet relatives that lived, you know, before I was born. And so that that is a theme that is throughout all of my novels, this folding of time where generations can meet each other or... Um, know of each other um, in a better way. Um, it used to be called time travel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe time travel is a little different because I there's three ways that I can think of that people deal with, authors deal with different times. One of them is to write in a different time, you know, like a historical novel. Another one is time slip or time travel. And the third one is what I did in one of my books, which was dealing with two separate times where the plot, the yes. plot elements eventually mesh. Yes, and you figure I've out done that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I like that. I, I enjoyed doing that. Um, and then the latest book I wrote is just in a different time because I didn't want to deal with technology. So I did. Yeah. I wanted to have the plot to be simple and so... Uh, and I know some authors take advantage of the technology and really, you know, I'll write a, a book that's very good as far as technology is concerned. So, all right, tell us more about the plot. Well, you can weave the characters in, maybe that'll make Yeah, sense. Philip, Philip is 18 years old uh, when he goes back in time. Uh, a few months earlier, he was in high school and um, he had an assignment for his photography class. And he was supposed to, it takes place in Sayville on Long Island. So he was supposed to go down to the park and the water and take a picture of the sunset. And there was an old man sitting there with an aide next to him. 
And he asked the old man, can I take a picture of you with the sunset? And the old man says yes. And after he does, he comes over to talk to them. And the old man hears his voice. And now the old man is so old that he has cataracts, he can't see well, but he hears his voice. And he takes this bony finger and pushes it into his chest, Philip's chest, and says, I know you, Philip. And Philip is like, well, it's a small town, you know. But he's like, no, I know you, and she's waiting for you. You need to go to Meadowcroft, which is John Ellis Roosevelt's summer home, on the night of the harvest blood moon during the sandstorm. So months later, it's October 29th, 2012, and it's the day of Superstorm Sandy. And it's also the night of the harvest blood moon. And Philip hears this and realizes what, Phil, what Lewis was saying about the sandstorm is really Superstorm Sandy. So he gets on his skateboard. He skates over to um, Meadowcroft. And he, the storm is starting to come, but he hears this girl crying for help and a dog yelping in pain. So he runs into the woods. And he sees this girl and this, this dog whose paw is caught in a raccoon trap. So he helps open up the raccoon trap. The storm is coming in full force now. The girl who's dressed in period costume, he just figures works at the museum. And they run into the house to get away from the storm. And that night, he finds out that he's gone back 100 years in time. Um, there is a, he has a backpack that his mother has he had his regular backpack? He t his mother tells him before he leaves the house, it had a a rip in it. I'm sewing it. Take your old backpack, and he shoves a flashlight in it. But there's other items in there he's unaware of. That night when he's opening up, and he starts looking through it, there's a letter from his mother because she knows he's going to go back in time because it's history. It's already happened, and she's a genealogist who's spends her time on ancestry searching for him. So she knows he's going to go back. She has to let him go because his descendants are in her life. And if she doesn't let him go back, they don't exist. And she already loves them. They're her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren. Whatever. They're, they're his great-grandchildren. They're her grandchildren. But if they don't, they're not her grandchildren. They're his grandchildren. So they don't go, if she, he doesn't go back in time, they don't exist. So she has to let him go, which is a real tug, you know, for the mom to let him go, but she has to. So who do you base your characters on? Philip is based a lot on my son. Um, he has a lot of the same characteristics. And um, Grace, who is Philip's mother, is really me. Um, letting go of my children, imagining them having to go somewhere so far away that I would never see them again. Um, again, with genealogy, I think often of the parents who had to let their children go across an ocean and never see them again and never see their grandchildren and the slow process of writing a letter and it reaching. It's just that pain is so unimaginable to us today um, when the world is so small and and we can speak to each other so instantaneously. So to let that son go is just, to me, was a very emotional thing. And writing that letter, I was crying when I was writing it because I was writing it to my son. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Hannah is another part of me. Hannah is the girl that Philip meets when he goes back in time. And She's in each of my story. books, I deal with some challenge that I've dealt with in life. And Hannah is a reporter for, eventually, is a reporter for the Suffolk County News. And she is writing about timely events, um, such as suffrage and later on um, prohibition. And she takes stances that aren't popular at the time. Mm -hmm. And she gets a lot of backlash from people who live around her, from possibly family members, but also from community members, and um, there are a couple of women who were real. Um, Ida Gillette really lived here, and she was an inspiration for a lot of people, and Alva Smith Vanderbilt Belmont, um, who's 
uh, was a very wealthy, rich woman who lived in this area at times also. Um, she built Idle Hour in Oakdale. And they both tell her, you have to hold your head up and be who you are and show people who you are because if you don't, people will believe what they say about you. And if you keep your head up and you keep going strong, then people will see the truth. And so it's a difficult thing to do. I've learned it's a very difficult thing to do, but it's something that you need to do if you want people to know who you are, who, what your heart is saying, and not what people say about you. So who is the Bayman? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> well, I live in Sayville in a house that was built in the early 1900s. And there was a man who in 1915 lived here whose name was Andrew Tuthill. And I changed his name to Andrew Trumbull. And um, it, the family is not anything about Andrew Tuthill, but just because he was a bayman who lived here, and I live along the um, Browns River, which Beddocroft is also along, I could look out my window and imagine what it looked like 100 years ago and imagine what life was like. And so the house in the story is my house, and it changes over time as people are building onto it, but it starts out as a Bayman's Cottage. So that's the Bayman's Cottage. And is Hannah the Bayman's daughter? Yes. Okay. Um, Hannah's the daughter of a Bayman, Andrew. She's also the daughter of a maid who works for the Roosevelts. Mm -hmm. And she witnesses some really tragic scenes at Meadowcroft that really did happen. And she's also befriended by the Roosevelt daughters. And she becomes like a little sister to them. And that puts her between these two worlds. She's really not, you know, she's not part of this wealthy world. She's the daughter of a bayman and a maid, but she doesn't understand as a child that that's not her life. She, she comes, that's where she lives half of the time because she's always there with her mother. And so it's, um, as she grows, she realizes that, you know, she doesn't quite fit into either world. Okay, so you have managed to weave um, a story that does it end up as a romance there's definitely a role you know romance is, is definitely part of it between hannah and philip but okay. i don't my no, stories are about family novel. that isn't what i mean it's not a romance novel but you manage to weave romance genealogy history and time travel all in one book which sounds very interesting to me and the core <laughs> of it is family it, it's it's family bonds, mm. um, loss, separation, and and moving on with your life and uh, trying to live with that those losses that we all experience. Who is your readership? <laughs> okay, so my the ten box secret is a young adult novel. Um, it's really was me going back to my childhood and rewriting it. So it's the 1960s. Um, but I found that most of my readership for The Tin Box Secret were women over 40. So I started writing to them because um, I found that the younger people wanted to read about vampires and they really weren't interested in, um, in, in heartfelt stories. Yeah, I, I had the same uh, experience with my books. I, I wrote them for young adults. And I find out that I have two readerships. One of them is young readers. In other words, a really good ninth, nine-year-old can read these books. I don't think they get as much out of it as a 14-year-old would. But then my other readership is older women. Yeah. And actually, some of the books men. Because one yes, of my books has a, I, I do too. Some, yeah. I, get, I love it when I go to read and there's men, men in the audience. I get so excited. I'm like, this is wonderful. There's men here reading my books because they're not just female driven. There's always strong male characters. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, I even think that having a strong male character in the book is very attractive to the, to the females who read it. And, and a vulnerable male ca character. Yeah, yeah, I, the mix is good. I, I think um, 
readership now, uh, people who actually read books, whether whatever their age are, they're more sophisticated. You know, they they can handle two parts of a plot at the same time. And uh, I think I think people in general enjoy history. I know uh, I did a, a workshop for a fifth grade class on um, actually it was all, all of my books, but one of the books takes place in Turkey. Um, another one goes back in time and, and whatnot. And, and they love these concepts. That these are the concepts that that grab them. And then I realized when I was a kid, I loved Nancy Drew. I loved, you know, some some other authors. But it was the, the seed that was sown that made me the reader I am today. You know, those things that grab you. And so I think your book really has a lot to offer. Um, but you said in an email to me that your favorite was the porcelain doll. So tell me about the porcelain doll. Um, there was a woman who lived in Sago named Regina. And on the Saturday after Thanksgiving at the Edwards Homestead, which is the oldest home in Sago, they have a holiday open house. And Regina would always be there dressed in her German outfit, talking about her childhood in Germany with the Christmas tree behind her, a pickle in the tree, and all of the traditions. Mm -hmm. And um, she also worked at my daughter's elementary school, and I was the Girl Scout leader. And I would bring the Girl Scouts there every year, and she would tell us about her childhood. But it went into much more than just her childhood. She lived there during the war, mm -hmm. and her father was the burgomaster, the mayor. And when her... Um, when she was supposed to be at his guest house, in case someone came in, he came home, found her missing. He went to his, her friend's house and saw her with her doll at her friend's house, took the doll and broke it. And because it was during the war, that couldn't be fixed. Mm -hmm. At the end of the war, her family became refugees as the Russian army was coming in. And they were starving. And she told us their stor her story about her childhood and what it was like. And it was really horrible. But I also have a friend whose mother, Erica, was a hidden child during the war. And she told me her story. And she was a child in Hungary while her grandparents were in Czechoslovakia. And the Nazis had come to take her grandparents away. And her grandmother gave her gold wedding band to her neighbor as payment and said, please try to get this note to my son. She never knew it made it because she died in a concentration camp, but it did make it. And it said, they have come for us. Surely they are taking us to our deaths. Save the children. And the two little girls were hidden in a convent. So she told me this whole story of what happened after um, her coming to America, the whole story. And at the end, she said to me, you're not going to use my name, are you? And I realized she was in her 80s and was still a hidden child. She was still afraid. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not writing your story but you're inspiring a character in my story. So in my story, these two women who never knew each other in life are children. They consider themselves sisters, but the world doesn't. And one is Catholic and one is Jewish and they survive this war and they have this porcelain doll that gets broken and they take this doll with them throughout their whole torturous journey. And that is a metaphor for them, that doll. The third person that inspired it, inspired it was my mother, who had Alzheimer's. And in the book, the main character, Issy, is an old woman, and she is writing this story and asking her granddaughter, Jace, to write this story because she's afraid she's going to forget it and she wants it written down. And Jace doesn't know that her grandmother has Alzheimer's yet. So it goes back and forth between the World War II time period and the current period with Jace. Jace has lost, just lost her fiance in a car crash in which she was driving. So she has guilt. Her grandmother has survived when so many others have not. So she has survivor's guilt. So the first line of the book is, it is one thing to live with grief. It is quite another to live with guilt. And both women are trying to find purpose in their life, why they are still here and why this is going on. And this comes from my own life because I was very ill in 2002 and it was shortly after 9-11 and I was in the hospital with sepsis and uh, it was strep in my blood system and I was 
in congestive heart failure, respiratory arrest, renal failure. I was put on life support. I was put into a, a coma. And when I lived, when I came out of it, I felt, why do I get to live when so many other parents didn't? Why do I get to go home to my children when other parents who died in 9-11 didn't get to go home? As a PTA president at the time, we lost three fathers in our neighborhood. And so I just, it was all raw and real at that point, And I just didn't get to see why I was going to get to go home. So I dealt with my own survivor's guilt. And so that is what I deal with in that book. And so every one of my books is cathartic in some way for me. Mm, yeah. And, you know, I think while you were talking about the two ladies of World War II, those people are so old now. Most of them are gone. And they're so old. And their stories are so important. And it's, that's why it's so great that writers write their stories. Because if we forget their stories, we forget the lessons of history. And, and when, when The Porcelain Doll was ready to be published, I asked her daughter if I could acknowledge her, Erica, in the book. And she said she'd be honored. So that was a real privilege. Uh, Regina, who used to dress up in the German outfit, she passed away. Um, so when I finished writing the book, I went to the um, Edwards Homestead and I gave the book to her daughter and granddaughter. So um, felt like that was full circle. And there's a picture of us with me giving it to them and there's orbs all around us. So I like to think that that was Re Regina being there. She probably was. <laughs> I'd like to think that after you pass over, that you can go anywhere you want. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take all those trips I've always wanted to do. And it's my uh, favorite book. How? Yes. I can see why. Um, so how are you marketing your books? Well, you're, you know, you're, you're traditionally published, correct? I, I'm self-published. Self you self-published, okay. You're one of them. Um, yeah, I've, you know, <laughs> sent it, my books out many times to many literary agents and have been rejected. And um, I, you know, I remember putting out that first book and pressing go and being terrified. Um, I had before that started a blog and I had a lot of, I had a huge audience for my blog. And that was um, just about life experiences. Um, genealogy, uh, family stories, different. It was, it's, it was started as it was called, it's called raising drama. It, I started it when my daughter was turning 13 and I was terrified, but it morphed into all of this other, um, avenues. And I just have so such, such a large audience. And so I started taking the things that I was writing in there and putting them into a novel, which was my first novel, which was going back to my childhood and writing about what I did in my in my book was to resolve issues that couldn't be resolved in life that weren't resolved in life. Mm -hmm. And um, that when that was published, I didn't know if it was good or not. But then people started reading it that I didn't know and contacting me. And it just started building and building. So one book. Then it, you know, they read the next one. Then they read the next one. They were waiting, and the audience kept growing. So it's been over time. It's it's been because of them, those who have become my fans and my readers. They are the ones that keep promoting it and keep going. It keeps going forward, and they want the next book. And that, you know, it's it gives me pressure to write the next book, but at the same and to make sure that it's going to be just as good, if not better. But what's what's the link to your blog? What's your what's your address? Well, okay, so my blog, blog is www.raisingdrama.com, but you can also get to my blog from my yeah. author page, which is teresadadaro.com. So it's raisingdrama.com or teresadadaro.com. Okay, all right. No, that that's that's a good way to do it, and I I understand people are you know successful like you doing it. Um, what else do you do to promote the book? Because a lot of our viewers like to know, you know, they're starting out, they like to know, how do you get a book out there? Well, you know, at first I did, you know, I paid for advertising and I entered competitions <laughs> and I just found that it was a lot of money and I wasn't getting much in return. Mm. Um, <laughs> it it comes, I started doing 
book talks um, at libraries, at, oh, at assisted living homes. They yeah. are an audience that is there. You don't have to worry if they're going to show up. Um, audiences like that, finding the audiences that are there, going um, to pilot clubs or um, different org community organizations where you know there's a meeting and you know that people are going to be there. And then talking to um, local businesses and asking if they'll carry my books. Mm -hmm. And it just, it just, it, you keep building on whatever you did. You have um, an interview, you have a newspaper article written about you and you just keep going and you put that all into your website proving who you are. The The reviews prove who you are. When people start reviewing you and they are people you don't know. You can't trust your family and friends. It has to be someone you don't know. Well, it's not really their job, right? Um, do the books that you read, because I'm sure you're a reader, do the books that you read uh, influence your writing? Yeah, I um, I like historical fiction, and um, the the book that started it all. I'm trying to think of the name of it because I can go blank pretty quickly. Um, oh. Time and again. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, it was the secret of secret life of bees. Oh, okay. And that story, going back to the early '60s, I just was, I was so captured by it. Either you know what's going to happen and you can't wait for it to happen, or you don't know and you can't wait to find out. And that's the kind of thing that keeps me going. And I wanted to. That book was so personal. It was so revealing to the characters' feelings. And I just was so captured by it. And that is what I, that's when I decided that's the kind of book I was going to write. Well, that's great to have that specific inspiration. Um, so we have a, a couple of minutes left. Uh, what's in the future for you? I'm writing a novel I believe is going to be called Fortune and Shame. And it's uh, based around Kinequat State Park, which was the mm -hmm. uh, Southside mm -hmm. Sportsman Club, and that is the reason that all the wealthy men came out here. Yes. Um, so it's going to be taking place in the 1850s, going up to about 1900, and um, I'm dealing with different characters that are going to all come together at some point, um, but you're going to get different points of view from different characters and then it comes together but it's going to tell a story of this area again because i have a huge following in this area but it's also little known history which is what i love to um, yeah reveal that was a men's club. hunting club in there wasn't it yes the south side the, sports the building club. yeah yeah which is That's fascinating cool. They have great, the uh, hiking paths are great. Yes, yeah. and there's a very old church on Montauk Highway, St. John's Episcopal Church, that was there, you know, before the Revolution. So that is also part of the story. The yeah, Nichols family. Sable. Sable is one of my favorite towns on Long Island. It's such a, a quaint place. I kept my boat there for a while. <laughs> so, um, in Westons. I don't even know if Westons is still there. So um, I really appreciate your doing the show, and uh, I will be emailing you with uh, an idea for um, writing book reviews, and uh, because I think reviews always help. And uh, any last minute advice for? I just want to thank my readers and ask them to please continue to tell others, because one person tells another and tells another. Um, you know, buy the books for gifts, not just for yourself, and open oh, my readership because that's what I need. I count on you. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And you made the newspaper, I noticed. Actually, yes. my friend noticed, gave it to me, and I mailed it to John Todd. So. <laughs> so you got into his newsletter. Okay, so thank you, Teresa. And uh, Thank you, Linda. If you do another book, you can certainly come back on the show. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.